In Athens, a big city, people got really confused when they mixed money, debts, and business stuff with how they should behave morally. They compared life to being in debt to the gods, like an obligation, and even talked about debts of respect or honor. They even thought of debt as a bad thing and revenge as a way to collect payment, like a debt collector. But the interesting thing was, the more they tried to use money to figure out right and wrong, the more it seemed to cause problems. So, if debt was tied to being moral, it raised questions, if money, which made things seem clear and easy to measure, was fueling not-so-good actions, what was the real meaning of it all? This idea of deciding what's right happens a lot in philosophy, especially in Plato's famous book called The Republic. It takes place in ancient Athens around 2,500 years ago. Socrates talks with a rich friend who owns a weapons business. They talk about what justice is, and the friend thinks being able to pay debts is very important and good. But Socrates asks a tricky question. Imagine someone loans you their sword, gets very crazy, and wants it back. Would it be right to give it to them? These kind of conversations led to deep thinking about ethics, which are rules about what's right and wrong, and moral philosophy, which is the study of those ideas. Socrates' example shows how even from simple everyday situations, philosophers can start to explore complex moral dilemmas. So, here, a man named Polemarchus was talking about a different kind of debt, not just borrowing and returning things, but about treating people fairly being good to your friends and not hurting your enemies. This is about justice. But Thrasymachos, a smart talker, believed that talking about justice was just a way for powerful people to control others, like a shepherd claiming to care for sheep but actually for their own benefits. Socrates saw things differently. He said that being a good ruler is like being a doctor, they help people even if they don't always get paid. Governance should be about making society fair, not just about money or power. He thought that if there's an art to being a leader, it's about bringing justice, not just benefiting themselves. Thrasymachos said that it's only because we have money that we think of power and self-interest as universal goals. Socrates suggested the key was to find people who would be leaders for honor, not for personal gain. So, the debate was really about understanding the true purpose of leadership and whether justice could be a goal in itself, or just a tool for the powerful. Socrates, a famous thinker, talked about new ideas for the government. He suggested having wise leaders called philosopher kings who would help make rules. He also talked about big changes, like ending marriage, families, and having our own things. It's like he was trying to shake things up. Socrates talked about debts, first by imagining them like simple businessman's deals. Then, he thought about honor as a more noble reason for paying debts. But he realized that in a world where money and being successful mattered a lot, it wasn't always easy to tell who was right and who was wrong. So, Socrates finally arrived at a very realistic idea that nobody truly owes anything. Maybe people should focus on making money for its own sake. But even this wasn't enough. He felt that we needed a big change to fix the confusing rules and make things make sense. Many people who considered his ideas found that while change might solve some problems, it also had risks. So, we're left with a big puzzle. Do we stick with the old, messed up system or try something new without knowing if it might be even worse? This question has been with us for a very, very long time. Plato, a famous ancient thinker, once faced a difficult situation. He went on a boat trip that didn't go well, and he ended up being captured and put up for sale on Aegina. But good thing happened, a philosopher named Anacares from Libya, who loved wisdom, found Plato and saved him. Plato felt grateful and wanted to pay him back. Plato's friends collected 20 silver minas to help with the debt. Anacares didn't accept the money, saying it was his honor to help another thinker. This act of kindness made Anacares known for his generosity. Plato used the money to buy land for the famous academy, where he taught. Even though Plato was successful later, he might have felt a little uneasy about how much he owed Anacares, who wasn't even from the same country as him. This might explain why he never included Anacares in his stories, as a lesser-known person to him. 
We know Anacares only because other writers wrote about him later. In ancient Rome, just as in Plato's story, issues around property and freedom were important. People's status and their relationships with others often involved debts, gifts, and responsibilities that shaped their roles and obligations to each other. The concept of honoring, repaying debts, and the interplay between wealth, gratitude, and friendships were common themes during those times. Plato's work shows how debt's confusing nature has affected the way we think about doing the right thing. When we look at Roman laws, we can see how debt has shaped the systems and rules that guide our everyday lives even today. German expert Rudolf von Jering believed Rome was a superpower for three main reasons. Its strong armies, its religion, and its laws, each of which had a bigger impact than the land it controlled. Even though Rome, had a small footprint on earth, its influence through Roman law is massive. Law students around the world, from South Africa to Peru, learn in Latin, a language rooted in ancient Rome. Many essential concepts in law, like contracts, responsibilities, injury cases, ownership, and where courts handle cases, have their roots in Roman legal thinking. In a broader sense, Roman law shapes our ideas about citizenship, what rights people have, and how societies function. It forms the backbone of how we think about rights and liberties, which influence how we make decisions and live our lives in political settings. So, debt's impact on society is deep and far-reaching, even in areas we don't immediately associate with Roman times. Jering, a famous person, believed that the Romans made law a true science. Even so, Roman law had some strange parts that made it hard for later lawyers to understand. A strange part was how they defined property, called dominum. In Roman law, property meant a strong connection a person had with something they owned, almost like they had complete control over it. But this idea was confusing because it's not easy to say how a person relates to things that aren't alive, like trees or rocks. For example, imagine a man stuck on a desert island. He might talk to the trees like friends. But does that mean he owns the trees? It doesn't really make sense because there's no one else around to talk about rights. So, on a deserted island, questions about property are not really important. It's a good example that shows how Roman law's definition of property led to a lot of discussion and questions. So, property isn't just about you having a thing, like your shoes or car. It's more about agreements or arrangements that people make with each other. For example, when you say you own something, it means everyone accepts that you can use it without others stopping you. It's like a silent promise to everyone on earth that they won't bother your belongings. Sometimes, we simplify the idea by thinking our rights to things like property are absolute and wide-ranging, but in reality, they're not. If you say you have complete power over your chainsaw, that's not true. Outside your home, most actions with the chainsaw would be against the rules, called illegal. Even inside, there are limits to what you can do with it. The only true absolute part is your right to not let someone else use your chainsaw. It's all about permissions and restrictions shared between you and everyone else, not just you and the thing itself. In ancient Rome, people believed that property belonged to individuals, and they had complete control over it. They could use their things, enjoy the benefits from them, like the fruits or produce, and also decide what to do with them as they wished. The Roman law didn't delve too much into how to manage these rights because they felt that the fine details were not something the law needed to regulate. Sometime later, around the 12th century, the rules became more specific. The jurists added three parts to understand ownership better. Usage, which means using the thing, fruits or enjoyment, like getting good from the thing, and abuse, like not using it responsibly. But the early Roman lawyers weren't really concerned with whether having property was considered a right because rights usually involve agreements between people. With property, it was more about someone's natural ability to use it without outside rules, as long as social rules didn't get in the way. People's power to manage their property wasn't based on making deals or promises. It was just a basic part of how the world worked at that time. Isn't it strange that something as simple as a piece of string could be used to define property rights? In any time or place, from Japan to Machu Picchu, 
you could pretty much do whatever you wanted with a string, twist it, knot it, break it, or burn it without worrying about laws. That would never be the foundation of property rights in any other legal tradition. But in our history, it's like property rights began in a big twist. Orlando Patterson, a smart thinker, believes that the idea of private property, which means complete control over things, really grew out of slavery. Think of it this way. When one person owned another person, the line between the person and their belongings became blurred. The owner saw his slave not just as a human, but also like a thing, like a piece of property. In Roman law, slaves were called res, which means a thing. This explains why the focus on absolute property rights made sense, because it's rooted in a system where one person had complete power over another. It's a connection that might not be obvious at first, but makes sense when you understand the origins of how we define ownership today. The idea of having complete ownership or control over something, called dominum, wasn't always around. It started showing up in Latin language later in the Roman Republic. This was a time when many people were captured and brought to work as slaves. As Rome became a place with lots of slaves, it faced some big challenges. By around 50 BC, Romans began to think of workers, like people who picked peas on farms or brought them to markets, as if they didn't have their own freedom. These millions of people who were both human and considered property caused lots of legal problems. The Roman lawyers had to be very smart to figure out how to handle these situations. If you want to see examples of these legal issues, you can look at books written by Roman jurists, like Ulpian from the second century. His writings give us a glimpse into the complex thinking they did to deal with the tricky rights and responsibilities between owners and slaves.